This is Coda Radio, episode 162, for July 13th, 2015. Welcome to Coder Radio, Jupiter Broadcasting's weekly talk show taking a pragmatic look at the art and business of software development and related technologies. This episode is brought to you by our two fine sponsors, DigitalOcean and Linux Academy. I'll tell you more about those great sponsors as this year's show goes on. My name is Chris, but that's not important. What's more important is our host who joins us every single week from the East Coast. Why, yes, ladies and gentlemen, it is indefinitely, indubitably, Mr. Michael Dominic. (laughs) Hey there, Michael. Hey, Chris. How are you? Indubitably well, Mr. Dominic. Indubitably. (laughs) (laughs) <laughs> how are you is actually the more important question. Uh, I'm alive. You know how it is. It's it's never easy. No, I don't know. I don't know how it is. I, I imagine you're surviving, but have you been? were you able to successfully take it easy for a little while? No, no, no. <sighs> of course not. That's not what you're supposed to say. You're supposed to say, no, this was the time where I finally took it easy. I realized no. that this was the sign that I truly needed to listen to myself and relax. That's what you were supposed to say. Well, the, yeah, but there are realities, you know, people are not patient, all that kind of fun stuff. Hmm, yes, I do understand that, too. So, uh, are you are you back up on your feet, then, I take it? Yes. Yeah, to a point. I mean, I'm really not 100%, but... Mm-hmm, mm-hmm. Well, Mr. Yeah. I was thinking about you all week, Mr. Dombeck, and I thought, I, I see, this is why I knew I should have flown you out here. Had you laid up in the Pacific Northwest, that way you couldn't have worked. It, it would have it been too warm. It would have been too hot. We had like a heat wave the, this whole week. I was miserable, but it's okay. I've got a cold soda and I'm ready to start. There's not a lot, not a lot happening this week, but there is one thing that I, I feel like we could touch on that has sort of like just never been addressed, and it continues every single year to bite developers right where it hurts, where they make money. Uh, are you ready to talk about this, or is there anything else you want to touch on? I'm gonna take that. Uh, you know, let, let's just go for it. All let's right. just go. Yeah. So uh, this is, I know, your old soapbox, and this year I, I just I couldn't believe it. Here we are; it's 2015, and this is still a problem. Uh, a blog post over at MacStories.net on the negative App Store reviews during the betas of iOS and OS 10. Earlier this week, Apple released the first public betas of iOS 9 and OS 10 Captain Edition, and of course, as has been the case every time, applications that are not updated to work with these new operating systems are still available to end users, and they are reviewing them poorly, giving them bad ratings. Um, so, of course, developers react strongly. They see developers that tweet out, uh, say, gotta love one-star reviews for, for iOS 9 beta users, and this was from the uh, screens in day one uh, developer, he, uh, uh, Paul Main. He tweets that out. Uh, Broken with iOS 9 is another common review, one star. Yeah. Uh, what's even more unfortunate, they say, is this happens annually for every single iOS and OS 10 developer seed. Uh, but I fear the problem will be exasperated this year by the avail- availability to the public, means anyone else can try it, and therefore... There's going to be more people giving bad reviews this year. Now, here we are. Here we are in 2015. And this still isn't addressed, Mike. Now, last week we talked about, like, or it was the week before, we talked about um, how they were playing with developers by pulling out anything that had the Confederate flag, even, like, legitimate, like, Civil War, like, history reenactment stuff. And they just pulled all of it. And you you were pissed because you said that's Apple using uh, their power to just screw over developers to make a statement. And see, in in my opinion, that wasn't as egregious as a move because they have to set a a tone for their store, and and their store has a certain tone, and that draws in a certain kind of customer, and that's what works for them. I didn't really see as huge of a problem with it. But this, this truly hurts developers. It lowers their ratings. It it hurts discoverability. It hurts future sales. And yet every single year, they get burned. And the very people that Apple needs to report bugs and make their system better gets burned. The very people that are helping make their platform better gets burned. And I don't understand year after year after year why this isn't addressed and if anything to me this is the most egregious thing Apple does here towards developers you know I, you know I'm too much of that I mean isn't it the user's responsibility to not rate apps based on beta software Chris is gone he's left my whole world uh, no I know I was just I I don't know if I have an answer for you I don't think so, no. I guess is my answer. 
uh, because uh, I think you're expecting too much if that's the case. So then what would you do? Block block reviews for developer for users on yeah. betas? Yeah, exactly. Oh, okay. Yeah, why and why don't and, and see that's what I don't understand is it's such a simple fix. It's such a simple fix. If you're using a non released version of the OS connecting to our app store, which they have total control over from end to end, it's such a simple fix that they could just turn that one setting on and then they would solve this problem. And 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 how can somebody give a legitimate review of an application based on an operating system that's still being developed? You can't. So what is the, even the basis of allowing those users to put a review in there? I don't understand. Yeah, I have no idea. It seems so basic and obvious, and yet they don't address it. To me, that seems to, be, that seems to speak to a larger intent that I think is a big problem. And that we just kind of paper over every single year. But yet every single year this happens. And this year, and last year too, now that they're public betas, the issue is so much worse than it's ever been when we've talked about it on the show before. Like, I know this is a topic that has come up before on this show, but it is, uh, it is, when we talked about it before, it was when the betas were private and developers were leaving the reviews, and it was a much more contained problem. And, you know, of course, anybody who leaked it, which was, you know, several thousand. But now, now, it, now who knows? Now it's public. It, it's going to be a much larger issue. Uh, Amicon says you can't. It's all Apple and users' fault. Users shouldn't be that stupid, too. I see. I just don't. How do you expect users to know, like, when you make something public like this, do you, I, I think you're expecting too much to have users to understand that maybe, like, there's, there's things like APIs or, or core technologies that change and get updated. Like, how could you expect them to understand that? That's not even, you know, really what So, so what, what would you do? Would, would you just not have it be available to the general public then? Well... I, I guess that's what you're saying. I mean, that no. that's kind of... No. No, I guess... What about... Okay, so there, there's two approaches, right? Why about, what about, uh, during beta, only applications that have been updated for the new uh, OS, like have been resubmitted by the developers with the, you know, compatible with iOS 9, what if only allowing those apps to be installed on the devices? So you just say, you get a more limited app store. And you know what? That's one of the downsides to using a beta. If you'd like the full app store, go use the released version of the OS. And that way, you're testing, you're helping, you're helping developers test their iOS 9 compatibility, and you're limiting the damage, so that way they're not going and, and, and ripping like some camera application that's totally taking advantage of stuff in iOS 8 that you know, has changed in iOS 9. Yeah, that's, that's not fair. Or you block all iOS 9 users from re- leaving reviews at all. Oh, well, oh, okay, Alex. Yeah, that's true, actually. You know what? I did know that. Alex does remind me that third-party developers cannot necessarily submit their iOS 9 compatible apps yet. So that actually wouldn't work. You know, how big of a... Yeah, I mean, it's a problem. It's happened. It's I'm happened surprised this doesn't upset you more, to be honest with you, because you, you, you often are so focused on the, the intention behind their actions, and to me, this screams of a bad intention. So... I guess I don't see the evil. I just see the stupid, right? Um, what, what's the evil? Letting it go on for this long? There's no way it hasn't been brought to their attention. You, you know how closely they watch the news. They watch all of this stuff, and they just let it go on year after year. And what they should have done is last year when they made the, when they made the first public beta available, they should have made the fix then. Whatever the solution is, whatever apple solution they come up with, that's when they should have implemented it. And I think where the evil comes in is that I, I, if, I think if you accept, and I, I think it's undeniable, I think if you accept that they are aware of the problem, and I think that's unquestionable that they are aware of it, if you accept that they are aware of the problem, then that's where it gets evil. Because then they are knowingly not solving a problem for all of the developers on their platform that they have total power and ability to solve. Absolute total power. No other company needs to be consulted. No partner has to have a negotiation. No contract has to be signed. Wait, 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 wait. Code okay, can be just so changed, and they could make this fix, this filter that doesn't allow iOS 9 users to leave comments. They could turn that on today. You, they could probably write that in Swift in 15 minutes. <laughs> oh, that's good. What did I, wait? What did you just say? <laughs> I'm saying, what did you just say? I'm saying what is evil is that because Apple could fix this within probably a day... And they've known about this for this long. That's what's evil about it. They choose not to. With all of their money, all of their resources, how important this entire platform is, 
that's that's the nasty deed that, that they're not fixing. It's like uh, it, it's like not taking care of a of a gaping wound that people that you know needs to be addressed, and you just choose not to do it. It's negligent. It's negligent. Negli- right, you're you're throwing around some some pretty heavy uh, to be honest, heavy terms. To be to be honest, I'm surprised we are not on the same page on this. I, it it, it well, kind okay, of well, me a little it, bit. It, it, okay, but you know why we're not on the same page? Because I remember what it was like previous versions of iOS when no one tested it and people got all these new phones in the fall and shit was broken. Right? And you had yeah. so many angry customers. Yeah, yeah. Yeah. yeah, yeah, they had to go public. Because it was like, it was just not, stuff was not getting tested enough. And you can't sit here and sell the premium phone and have the buggiest operating system. That's pretty embarrassing. Right, you can't be like, oh, we're the top of the line for the smartphone yeah. market, which they are. Sorry, guys, but they are. And be like, oh, but every fall, yeah, your phone's going to break. Yeah, every fall, you know, don't use your phone for about three months. Yeah, that's not going to work. I, I would almost prefer this to... So that now, was the core problem. I mean, the core problem is they're trying to get a more... The, the, they're, the, the, what they're trying to get to is a more stable operating system. They want they right. want iOS and OS X to be more well-tested. I, I, I am, dude, I'm all about that. I'm all about that. Absolutely. Uh, but that doesn't, but I don't think that means you can't have one without the other. There has to be a, there has to be a line drawn that still protects developers. And I, here's what I would like to advocate for. Uh, come up with a whole new system. But in t- as long as you are forcing people to deliver their applications and make their livelihood through your app store, you have to have a there, as a I, I, this is as a platform vendor. You have a certain amount of responsibility to make sure that their fine products are not getting crapped all over because your product is still under development, right? I, I just to me, I, I guess we can. But, I mean, so, I just so, so so the thing is though, right? You, you're absolutely correct. Like what you're saying is, you know what, fender benders are annoying, and I'm going to use a really dumb analogy here. But what it was like, you know, iOS seven. Etc. It was like car. It was like three car pileups, right? <laughs> like every fall, it was awful. Yeah. Um, I uh, mean, it was re- it was really and, and and believe me, it is frustrating, right? If something's de- you know becomes deprecated, or they change the API, or whatever they do that breaks your app. I'll make. I'm gonna but, make my last plea to, to get you go. to come to my side, then I'll then I'll drop it. Imagine you have your app, uh, Code Journal or whatever it is, and and you know you're just so close to climbing the discovery charts. You know you got a couple of good reviews. You've had some people given some reviews. They've starred you, and you're making the climb up. And then and then yesterday, iOS nine comes out, and there's a bug in iOS nine that causes Code Journal to crash. And all of a sudden, you get three or four one star reviews, and it tanks your app. It tanks it. And you did nothing. You changed nothing. And one day you're just trending your way up the discoverability charts, and the next day a beta is released, and boom! Now you're sunk to the bottom with an anchor. You don't see how that's how that could be so easily solved. Okay, but I don't think that's what's happening here, right? That's what used to happen. You get hundreds of one stars, or, or you know, fifty, sixty one stars in a day, which because of the way their weird algorithm works, destroys your ranking, right? Um, this is like some apps get, uh, for some users, have problems. And of course, if you're one of those users, that sucks. But mm. I, All right. I, I think I think you're pro- I mean, I, you, you are, of course, in an ideal world, right? That this should never happen to an extent. But since you've never been there, since you've never felt the pain, I don't think you know just how awful. I mean, you remember when we started the show? Every fall, I was always like, "Oh my God, I'm gonna die!" Right? It was through no fault of my own. Angry customer emails, angry phone calls. Why? Because they, especially back in, let's say, going to iOS five from four or six from five, right? They just deprecated stuff. Things just changed. Um, what if Rodrigo in the chat room is right? What if? What if this is Apple's heavy-handed way to force developers? to get off their ass and upgrade to the latest OS immediately so that way they can kill the bad reviews. What if this is Apple's, like, heavy-handed tactic? That seems shady. I mean, developer, you know, you're you're kind of incentivized to update your app as much as possible anyway. Um, obviously within reason, right? So, you know, being able to be one of the first... Um, 
the first developers to take advantage of any yeah, it any always helps. API. Yeah. It always helps. I don't, so I don't, every, you're, yeah, you're I don't, already... I don't subscribe to that theory anyways, because if that was the case, then they would let you submit updates during the beta period. Well, they do. So. They, just, they just wait. But you, don't, they, you can't publish they, them, right? Or am I misunderstanding? Uh, no, you, they go into like a queue. Yeah. So... But then they're published on the day, okay, right? There's okay, a, okay, okay. You, they wait for a certain level of stability in the API. Gotcha. Okay. Yeah. And then once that's reached, then they can start going out. Well, uh, that's fascinating, and uh, I'd like to get the rest of the. I'd like to get the audience's take on that. Let me know which side you fall down. Go over to JupiterBroadcasting.com and click the contact link and choose Coda Radio. Coda Radio from the drop down, and uh, let us know your feedback. I'd like to get some thoughts on that topic, um, especially now that it's becoming worse than ever. And you know, the other thing about that is this phenomenon might have Apple's name attached to it today, but every. OS, every desktop environment that is big has an app store now, N even GNOME. So this is not a problem that's going to go away at all. It's going to just get bigger and bigger. You know what I would do besides uh, go build myself a cabin out on the mountain somewhere is I'd probably go skill up and maybe uh, move my career along a little bit, maybe help myself out on my next review or just challenge myself a little bit. And that's where our next sponsor comes in or our first sponsor this week. Go over to linuxacademy.com slash coders. That supports the Coder Radio program. Oh, yeah. But it also gets you the Coder Radio discount. I love Linux Academy. It's such a great resource when you're ready to go up to the next level. It's great because it's built by real genuine Linux and open source enthusiasts, and it really shines in the type of material they, f they cover, but also in how passionately they cover those topics and how fast they're able to really dig in and understand them because they live and breathe them. And you know, they have step-by-step -step video courses, which is great, and they have downloadable, comprehensive study guides, and your courses come with your own server, which is super slick. You think about the value there, right? They just spin up when you need them. Seven plus distros you get to choose from. The courseware and the server automatically adjust to match that, which is really cool. You get to keep track of your progress as you go along, and I love that because I can log right in and say, boom, you're right at this point. It's going to take you this long to do this section. Helps me really wrap my brain around when I'm like, okay, setting up a basic Nginx install is going to, I'm, it's just going to take me an hour and 20 minutes to learn that from beginning to total scratch to end. I can grok that. I can wrap my brain around that. That is a quantifiable thing I can do to learn Nginx, and I dive in. It's, it's manageable for me. And I love their scenario-based labs. That way you get real hands-on experience when you go do this thing in production. It's not the first time you've done it. That kind of confidence means you have time to focus on really what you're doing, to document properly, and to really think through each step, because you're not freaking out, because, oh my god, it's the first time I've ever done this. That is super valuable right there. And they have instructor help when you need it. They've got nuggets to help you deep dive into single topics in between courses. And man, they've just refreshed their OpenStack stuff. Go take a look at that. If you're in the Red Hat courseware, they got the best stuff on that. I'm 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 getting emails from folks that are taking the Red Hat courseware and like, this is it, Chris. This you got to talk more about this. I'm like, I I know, I know. And you know, and really honestly, I should get No to talk more about it too, because that's what he does to stay fresh on his Red Hat enterprise skills for his business. Go over to LinuxAcademy.com/coders. Check them out. They got great courseware on Docker, on Python, Ruby. It's just like Android development. I mean, any it's not it's not just like the Linux basics. Like if you want to learn how to set up a Linux rig and back it up and make it sure it works, that's awesome. They got all of that. And they, you know, they're gonna have the best on that. But they also are everything around Linux and open source. That's all attached to that. All the stuff that is really like the core world now. That uh, is really a great place to be educated in. And that's why Linux Academy has come along at just the right plat, right, the right, the right time to have a platform like this. I'm really impressed by it. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. Go there right now and check out Linux Academy. See why I've been talking about them. See why I'm a paying member, and so is uh, Noah. And I've just set up a group. Well, actually, I haven't just set it up. I set up a group team account a while ago. I just really got to get, get around to inviting people. But I love this concept where you can have people collaborating with you, which is great for maybe a small team or a business. Uh, it's really neat. And, oh. Something else is the deck, the deck is a little stacked for the Jupiter Broadcasting audience. Because we've sent so many people over there now, their community is full of us. <laughs> so and they have a really great active community. If you ever have like a little lull or you get a tough spot or you want to boost or maybe you want to brag about your new certification, they have a great community around that. And uh, like I said, it's stacked full of Jupiter Broadcasting members. LinuxAcademy.com slash coder. LinuxAcademy.com. And oh, by the way, check them out because it is the summertime. I mean, you're not going outside, right? <laughs> That's where you get a sunburn. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. Check them out and make it the summer of learning. Why not? I would. LinuxAcademy.com slash coders. Big thank you to Linux Academy. All right. I love, we got an email and I wanted to read to the show. It's a little unorthodox, Mike. 
But this is how awesome the Jupiter Broadcasting audience is. So Jordan writes in. He's troubleshooting your email for you, Mike. He says, hello, Mike and Chris. Uh, he's a big fan of JB for several years now, regular listener to TechSnap, Last and Coder Radio. I'm not going to go into all the details that Jordan sent in here, but he was listening to Coder Radio 161 uh, last week, where Mike was complaining that nearly every email sent from his Dominic.com uh, domain was blocked and marked as spam. So he took the liberty of reviewing your MX records and uh, did a little troubleshooting for you, Mike, and, rec- and recognized that your A record for the MX record points to uh, does not have a PTR record. See, Mike, you got to have a PTR record so that way they can do uh, reverse lookups and whatnot. It's likely the reason for the blocks is many providers such as AOL, Hotmail, and Gmail will not accept mail if the MX record does not match the PTR record. Mike should talk to his hosting provider and request that they add PTR for, and it gives you the IP address you need to have added, Mike. And uh, then you'll be all set up, and right. it should resolve your spam issues. How about that? You just got you just, you got to give your your provider one IP address for the PTR record, and you're fixed up. That would be great. There's just one small problem. That's not the domain I do email on. Hmm. Hmm. But I think you're right because the uh, that is one of my oldest domains. It's on one of those old rickety providers. I have a feeling they don't do a lot of things. I'm just saying. <laughs> you know, it's funny as you've moved around yeah. over the years. You know, like I've mm-hmm. got I've got like a uh, a long tail now of like providers that are auto deducting things from my account that yeah. I just like have to keep around because I don't really want to move it off there or or whatever. And it's it's uh, it's funny how much the hosting co- industry has changed. Still, um, you know, like uh, uh, just a year or two ago, I was buying dedicated servers for like. Um, audio streaming, dedicated servers for voice chat, dedicated servers to do this, a dedicated server to do that. And now now I just put it all up on a on a on a droplet. You know, now I just have like one place I go and it just makes so much more sense now. Well you remember about like two years ago, right? Everything was gonna be just like you know, hourly metered kind of stuff. Mm-hmm. Not individual machines, but it you know, the droplets are an extension of that. But Yeah. And you know, know Azure they, they and feel- whatnot. Right, they feel more like servers to me, like more like real VPSs, don't yeah. they? Yeah, they do. Yeah. And 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 you know, uh, and the and it's kind of a nice middle spot there. Um, and so I just, I, it has been so interesting because when I when I when I really started in the industry, it was really everything was on premise. Um, in fact, when I really started, uh, the protocols that you used to communicate with your servers didn't route; they didn't go out over the internet. Um, and so to then watch that move to uh, the physical servers and racks where you're paying thousands of dollars a month for the bandwidth and the server and the power and the rack space. Like, you're, you're I, you know, like there's a company called Rackspace because that's what you paid for. You paid for space in a rack. Right. That's why it's called Rackspace. And back when Rackspace started, they were one of the first companies that would kind of do this on demand for you. And this was, I mean, on, on a large scale. And that seemed like a freaking game changer. And yeah, it was still hundreds of dollars a month, but it was a brick, and you could go buy. So what? So when Jupiter Broadcasting first started, well, we weren't Jupiter Broadcasting. We we had we had we had physical servers for the Linux Action Show domain and a show we used to do called Castablasta. We had physical servers that were dedicated to this task that sat in a rack in a state somewhere. One server, like it sounds so antiquated now because now today it's some hybrid monster that runs on scale engine that is distributed all over the world and it's stored in cache in ram on 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 cdns like it is a completely different absolutely distributed beast and that's the website and then when you go for infrastructure on demand with droplets and and other vps providers it you get it done in a matter of seconds instead of uh i I, it used to be weeks used to be two weeks to set up a server in iraq somewhere to get something going the shift yeah. to how available server infrastructure is it's changed the whole market really it, it blows it, my mind yeah it's it's insane yeah i uh, all right we got another email i want to read but uh, i just like uh, oh actually it was a whole thread it was a whole uh, it was all, there was a whole ser- there was a whole series of uh, responses in regards to your heart attack uh, but you know uh, we, i know we just talked about uh, we just talked about Linux Academy, but we, I really, if we're going to talk about DigitalOcean, I'm going to mention them right now. Uh, so let's talk about DigitalOcean. This is sort of our secret sauce, and uh, it's it is uh, it's it's like amazing. It's the glue that really makes things happen for us. Coder Digital is our promo code when you go to DigitalOcean. Use that promo code, support this show, and get yourself a ten dollar credit. So DigitalOcean is a simple cloud hosting provider dedicated to offering the most intuitive and easy way to spin up your own cloud server. Now, what Mike and I were just saying for the last few minutes. That's not a paid ad. We really feel that this is a revolutionary way to do this. It has changed the game so, so many, so many different ways. Uh, More than 500,000 developers have deployed on the DigitalOcean cloud. You can get started in less than 55 seconds. Pricing plans start only $5 a month. I was just telling you, 
I was just telling you, you'd be paying over $1,000 a month back in the day when you'd be renting space in Iraq for rigs that are less powerful than these digital ocean machines. So you're going to get, for $5 a month, you're going to get 512 megabytes of RAM, a 20 gigabyte SSD, all SSDs, one CPU, and a terabyte of transfer. And the pricing plans just step up from there really logically, really simply. It makes a lot of sense. And they've got data center locations in New York, San Francisco, Singapore, Amsterdam, London, and a beautiful brand new one in Germany with 40 gigabit E connections to each hypervisor. I mean, this is seriously high availability, very fast performing, worldwide distributed stuff here. And then you, you take all of that. With so, with so, so, so nuts, with so nuts, is in the old days when you would go put a, a, a physical server in the rack just to like run your own website and you know, you have to pay for your bandwidth and you, you know, so you're in maybe fifteen to $2,000 a month, there was still no system to manage it. Like, you know, you want to set up a VM, that's, you know, well, okay, spend a day setting up the operating system, the firewall, the network there at the, at the data center. Make sure you've got full remote access set up. Get your IP KVM configured. Okay, so that's your first day, and maybe get the OS installed unless you're doing it remotely using a virtual uh, CD ISO image, which means it's going to take hours and hours and hours. So it's about a day and all night, and then you've got your operating system installed, and then you get Apache and Nginx and MySQL or whatever you need to get set up and configured. Make sure you get that configured correctly too, because not only are you on the line for security. But you also have to get it set up properly, configured the way you need it. And don't forget, you've got multiple domains you need to configure for, and they're all coming from one IP address from the firewall, so make sure you get the DNS forwarding set up right from the firewall. You've got to get all that configured correctly. And make sure you've got all that to dialed in, and make sure you stay on top of those patches and those updates. And then by the time you spent two, two and a half days, you've now got a server. It doesn't have a management system. You can't easily transfer it to somebody else. You can't deploy applications with one click. You don't have one step access to snapshots. I mean, it's... Where we are at today in 2015 is a totally different game. It is a totally different game. DigitalOcean wraps it in this amazing intuitive control panel, which you can replicate on a larger scale with DigitalOcean's straightforward API. And there's a lot of great tools that already take advantage of that API. Just go to their community section and look at the projects and just scroll through the list of all of the great apps you can already use for your phone, for your desktop, for whatever, uh, for you know, Python libraries. I mean, there's everything. It really is a great system. And, you know, they're also paying authors to write technical articles for them, so that way they have the best documentation. You can go check that out. They have positions open because they're growing like crazy. They just got a new round of funding, which is amazing. DigitalOcean is on fire. I mean, they're really doing an amazing job. Go over to DigitalOcean.com, use the promo code CODERDIGITAL, and just play with this. They got Ubuntu rigs, Debian rigs, Fedora 22 is up there now. They have CoreOS and FreeBSD. For two months, you could play with any one of those and just learn something, or try to deploy your own application, or maybe de-Googlefy your, your life for two months and see how that goes. Run, a, run an experiment. Put OwnCloud up there. Put WordPress up there. Use Ghost. They got one-click installs. It's a really good system. DigitalOcean.com. Use the promo code coder digital. And a big thank you to DigitalOcean for sponsoring the Coder Radio program. We sincerely appreciate it. All right, so uh, we got a couple of bits of concern feedback for you, Mike, and I just wanted to cover them. Uh, so uh, <laughs> I like this one from Friday444. He says, this episode made me think twice before chugging my second monster of the morning and the pot of coffee I drank. Now, uh, he says it made him think twice. He doesn't say he made it. He didn't do it. <laughs> That's what I like about that. Yeah, he still, he still did it. Yeah. Right. right. Uh, now, uh, Docker hate, because he <laughs> apparently doesn't like Docker, uh, he says that was shocking. He wants you to post more details once you get things sorted out. Uh, and, uh, you know, also, Mike, uh, there, is, uh, there was another popular thread on there about uh, post-mortem updates. So we should, you know what we should do? We should do, like, a Reddit episode, one of these, just to get the, get the subreddit going again. We should do, like, a questions from the subreddit or something. What do you think? Would you want, want to do something like that? Yeah, I think we should do that, like an AMA on, on the air, yeah. Yeah, so uh, coderadio.reddit.com, and uh, I'll start a thread over there, and uh, I'll link it in the show notes for this week's episode, and then uh, you submit a question over there, and uh, we'll answer it on the show, and it could be quick or it can be long, and it could be for either one of us, for Mike or myself, and we'll probably answer most of them, I would imagine. There's probably only going to be a few, so go in there and answer them, because if there's not enough, it'll be like a 10-minute episode. That could be a backfire. You know what we could do then is just watch cartoons. Would you be up for that? I watch cartoons. I do that. I watch with cartoons. As long as JB Hawk right. and Truth came up with a good one, that'd, that'd work for me. All right. <laughs> I guess. Yeah, sure. Why not? I'm just. You know, I'm, I'm much more zen these days. I'm like, yeah, sure. You let's are. I do like it. it. All yeah. right. Well, uh, I, I, I there is one there is one story I'm avoiding this week. I just uh, I was planning to talk about uh, Nintendo pulling down uh, the or asking GitHub to pull down their Game Boy emulator, the one that we actually talked a little bit on the show about. Um, 
but I kind of feel like it's in bad taste to talk about N- Ninten- B- Nintendo being a bad guy right now with their CEO passing away last night. So uh, I just yeah. I, th- I yeah, thought it no. was of interest. You know, this going back to single sources, like GitHub again and again keeps getting takedown requests, and it makes me a little nervous. But you know, what is that about GitHub getting, or you mean YouTube? No, no, no. GitHub is getting DMCA takedown requests for for pro- software projects. Really? Yeah, they're <laughs> basically pulling the YouTube. They're basically being the YouTube of this stuff. This isn't the first one either. Uh, Popcorn Time was pulled down many times. Um, there's several others, obviously. And now uh, this uh, JavaScript-based uh, Game Boy emulator. Uh, with more than 20 games uh, up on GitHub were pulled down. Yeah, you know... I, I, so, is GitHub's policy, if you didn't include the games themselves, they would have let you do it? I don't think so. No, it's all based on copyright infringement within the DMCA. Um, So I I think uh, because they didn't just pull the games, I think the emulators are enough uh, standing. Just like, see, in the past, um, there's been tools tools like Popcorn Time that can download movies over torrents, and they didn't actually have any movies. It was just the code and a torrent client, and they pulled that down. Uh, See, that's, yeah. Yeah. At first, Nintendo said it was something to do with patents, but then uh, those uh, were cleared up and removed, and they say the text on some of the articles was removed to say it was not uh, patent-related. I, I, I bring it up because it, it reminds me a little bit of the App Store situation that, we're, that we run into, where uh, you have one point, and then these guys get to throw things around like this. So, I don't know. I know. I know. All right, Mr. Dominic, is there anything else you want to cover this week? You know, there was uh, one thing about Google releasing what people are calling a GitHub competitor. Yeah, Google oh, Code. I saw you tweet about that. What's that yeah. about? You know, I, I don't think it is a GitHub competitor. It looks like it's something to more easily integrate with their, uh, what is it, Google Code Engine, the now successor to the Google App Engine. Yeah. But interesting. Uh, I've just looked at it briefly, and I think I'm going to probably want to do a show on it. But it really looks like it's going to have some pretty advanced and easy to set up uh, continuous integration functionality, Ooh. which anybody who's ever dealt with QA uh, will 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 be very excited about. So something to look forward to, perhaps. Yeah, yeah, interesting. yeah I, I think it is. I mean, and that'd be another, something else the subreddit or anybody else out there could uh, could help us out with, huh? Interesting. Oh, also, I was writing Swift this week, but don't tell anybody. What? What are you writing? Oh. Well, you know that thing I was going to do, native or hybrid? Yes, yes. Oh, right. Yeah, yeah. Doing it hybrid. Oh, (laughs) but in Swift? But I I started in Swift, and I was like, eh, then I started doing it hybrid. But I think Swift, the beta, you know, see, I feel like this fall, Swift will be ready. Yeah, I mean, they're working pretty hard on it. And I guess the recent update, they changed a ton of stuff. Yeah, they did. It's a lot. A lot better, though. There's some weirdness with exception handling that I don't. But how mm. would you how would you describe your impression so far? You know, some of the syntax I don't love. Um, it definitely allow if you know the Coco API, it's really not that bad of a learning curve. There's a little bit of weirdness in, like one of my, one common misconception and one that I kept thinking, oh, Swift is like Ruby, it's, so it's weakly typed. Or dynamically typed, right? No, it's it's strong typing, for the most part. Hmm. So a string is a string is a string. A number is a number. A number. Hmm. Um, you can do weaker typing. I don't like how it does the delegate protocol pattern compared to Objective C does. Some of the syntax I feel like was let's just make this less verbose. Mm-hmm. But. I'm not sure how I feel about that. On the one hand, you know, easier I read. like I like that Objective C is easier to read because it's very it's like a sentence, all okay. methods. Okay. But picking up an Objective C project from someone else is often awful. Mm. Like you have a week in it, which I just recently did. You have like a week and a half of just reading, and there's not yeah. that there's anything wrong with the code. It's just there's so much code. Right. Right, and you don't know how things interact. Um, it's not fun. The other thing I've been playing with that will probably feature is Reactive Coco. Have you heard about this? No. It's functional programming brought to Objective C, and I think to Swift, but I'm only doing it in Objective C. 
reactive cocoa i'm googling it right now Re- reactive 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 okay yeah. uh, and this is uh, open source what is this it is open source actually uh, reactive cocoa is an implementation of functional reflective programming for more information yep. Reactive program. And uh, I like, well, there's not much on their site. <laughs> nope. It's all on the GitHub page, I guess. I'll put a link to this no, in the it's show all, notes. It, yeah, it's very GitHub heavy. It, this was a tough one. I'm starting to get it, but I, again, this is another one of those things that's very hot in the iOS developer community mm. that I'm st- that I'm feeling very curmudgeon-like. Oh, really? I love it. Yeah. Sometimes, though, that's how you start, and then you warm up after a yeah. while. You, you, come at it, you come at it from a skeptical angle, and then you kind of warm up. You know, that's not necessarily bad. Well, the... It's it's interesting. I mean, I, I get why it exists, mm-hmm. uh, and just so you know, the, the point of it, right, is to it does a lot of things very cleanly. Like one very simple use of it is you can have a field that just observe a uh, a property on an object and just always update, right? Very mm. sort of like I, I could see a world where you try to do an MVVM implementation with this, but even that is. You know, I, I'm not sure that, you know, Coco is an object-oriented, very OO design mm-hmm. framework, right? Mm-hmm. And all of these kind of little, let's try this other pattern on it. I, I don't know if they make sense. It, it, it almost seems like you're fighting the tide, right? Mm. Yeah, I like like that. folks who try to write functional Java, well, shouldn't you just be writing Scala? It's like you're. It's like you're. You're trying to deny what's coming. <laughs> right. Like like Swift is is, you know, it acts very functional, but it's still pretty oh oh at the end of the day. Mm. Um, it, I would say Swift is in a lot of ways superficially functional. Like it looks very functional, but you're not not really right. It, it it's not the same jump from Objective C to Swift in terms of functionalness. That I think Java to Scala is, mm. even though, of course, and we'll get the emails. There's tons of Scala people who just write Java code translated into Scala, right? I mean, it happens. Um, you know, I think a better example is actually like C sharp and F sharp, right? Oh. Even though I know, because F sharp is this is functional, yeah. and too bad, so sad. Um, hmm. Is that the future, right? So this is kind of what I've been doing. I have a little bit of downtime, kind of looking at. You know what's what's out there. I mean, actually, Alex Bell in the chat makes a great point. You know, UI's object-oriented programming. One of the big advantages it had at the time when it was new was it was great for UI code. So that's probably where Swift gets us a little bit of weakness. Is that or not weakness, but non-functionalness? Is an iOS app is all UI, right? At the end of the day, it's the prettier the better, right? Yeah. yeah. <laughs> Like, really? Yeah, if, as long as it's super pretty, you can put a price tag on it. Right. I I, I don't know, but I'm, I'm kind of doing a little wandering in the woods, um, looking at, you know, what are these things that I've been ignoring, because frankly, I was busy, right? Yeah. That I might want to take another look at, right? Hmm. Well, One other thing I've been looking at that I'm not going to talk about yet, but Elixir again, mm. just seeing what's going on there. Just checking in, huh? Yeah, just, just checking. Try, I like try that. To, Good for you. Yeah, trying to see what else is out there other than my OO slash Rails world. <laughs> yeah. Yeah. So, yeah, and if anybody can explain to me why I'd want to do functional programming on the front end, please do. Because I definitely get it for the back end. Like, I, some of those old Java Play things I still have running somewhere, if I ever had to do a version 2 or 3, probably be Scala. Mm. Like, it makes total sense on the back end. Um, the front end, though, it seems a little tough. But that's my spiel for today. Natch in the, re- in the chat room recommends you give Haskell a try. Oh, my lord. <laughs> uh, you know, this, uh, he, no. he is the second person today to, to talk to me about Haskell. Get it out of here. Yeah, uh, maybe, maybe, but I, I, I think it might make me crazy. What? Really? Uh, yeah. Hmm. I don't believe you. Oh. <laughs> Hey, when I have you, I can Business? I can respond to you with you. <laughs> That's fantastic. <laughs> oh, well, I like that update, Mister Dom. We can check in with us next week and let us know if you get any further on that. Yeah. 
It's I'm sure I'll hate one of them and be ranting by next week, so don't worry. <laughs> okay, good. Very good. Very good. I like that. Well, uh, all right. Now, I have a couple of bits of business to co- uh, to tend to, so don't forget coderadio.reddit.com. We're going to have the uh, the question thread there you can uh, toss your question into. We'll also have a feedback thread for uh, 1, 6 to 2, and also jupiterbroadcasting.com slash contact for the Coder Radio email form where you can choose Coder Radio from the drop down. If you want to join us live, go to jupiterbroadcasting.com slash calendar to get it converted to your local time zone. All right, Mr. Dominic, anything else we want to cover this week? Uh, no, unless someone wants to like mail me a Dell XPS 13. Right? That would be nice. Yeah. Do those just show up? Do those just, they just drop out of the sky? Hmm. Hmm. Well, I think Dell should do it because, you know, they're, That'd be good. they're hit. Yeah. yeah. Hardware for the Code Radio program provided That's by. Right. We could totally do that. Yeah. <laughs> I'm just saying, it would work. <laughs> All right. Well, uh, don't forget, hey, uh, Mr. Dominic, uh, people can follow you on Twitter. Where do you want them to follow you? Just go to at Dumanuka. Boom. And I'm at Chris Elias, a new account, so you probably have to follow me again if you haven't already. And at Jupiter Signal for the network. Don't forget JBLive.tv for the live stream. We do this show Monday at noon Pacific, 3 p.m. Eastern. And then it's out for download a little bit after that. All right, everybody. Thanks so much for this week's episode of Coda Radio. We'll see you right back here next week. Thank you.